rooted in place. Um, so rooted in place. There are people from every corner of the state of Maryland who, who come through, people from Washington, DC, from Virginia, from Delaware. You really have the feeling of a gathering point for the EJ movement in this, in this region. And actually, at this time tomorrow, there's going to be a panel um, on growing the EJ movement regionally. So I'm just plugging that. Would love for you guys all to come to that tomorrow. But in planning for this year and, and talking to Shikobi um, about this year's symposium, we were reflecting that it would also be valuable, complementing that deep place-based rootedness of the symposium would also be valuable to bring in voices of brothers and sisters who are taking on very similar struggles all around the world. And indeed, the, the, the struggle for environmental justice is a global one. <clears throat> I see, Rachel, that I'm getting asked to admit people, so maybe if you could do that, that would be great. Oh yeah, um, we are. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, the, the struggle for environmental justice is a global one, even though our contexts vary greatly there are deep commonalities between the kinds of injustices and problems that communities face, the kinds of strategies people are increasingly taking to address those challenges, and the kinds of demands that are emerging from EJ movements in many parts of the world in terms of what a genuinely just system and of environmental and economic governance would look like. And so that's what this panel is about. You are you 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 have entered the kind of global zone at the Maryland EJ Symposium. And we've got an all-star crew who I'm really excited to introduce you guys to. Um, we have Hassan Sisse, who I've known since I think 2005, Hassan. Um, you, you, maybe you could wave. Hassan is a legal empowerment advocate and an environmental justice organizer with the Namathi team in Sierra Leone. So great to have you, Hassan. And then we've got Felipe Zuniga, who's from an incredible group called FEMA in Chile. Um, hey, Felipe, great to have you. And then we've got Vidya Viswanathan, who works with the Center for Policy Research in India. She's based in Delhi, and she leads the team focused on environmental justice um, of CPR in India, which is Namathi's partner, partner in India. So hey, Vidya, we, we can see you here. I don't know why. It's can someone help me fix this? <laughs> you're, you're on. You're on a side. On, on the side. Maybe right. you can turn your camera on anyway. But um, um, it's a laptop, and it's okay. like um, okay. Which it's, should yeah. you just help fix this issue? Um, so let me um, kick us off by just going around and asking each of you to paint a little bit of a picture of what environmental justice looks like in your place. And, and maybe I'll start with Hassan. Vivek and others, thank you all for having me. It's a great honor. Um, I will start by giving a just brief background that the things that led us to the kind of environmental issues we are experiencing in our country, Sierra Leone. Um, Sierra Leone is a country that has gone through 11 years of war, which devastated a lot of infrastructure and especially the economy. So immediately after the war, the, our government saw the need that there is, um, there was urgent need by the government to rebuild the economy. So as a result, they ushered in a lot of um, foreign direct investment. And as a result, we had influx of um, multinational, multinational com companies operating in the country. And these, they came at a time when the legal framework for the protection of the environment was very, very weak. And the process of acquiring land from the communities, I would say was one of the major factors for the, the environmental injustices communities are facing now. They take land from people where they cannot negotiate with them. They cannot have a, con a consultation with the communities that have their land. And these are the basis for the environmental violations. They, 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 they violated um, environmental laws, 
procedures, policies, and even the customs and tradition of the people. So as a result, they, they form the bank as a benchmark for causing the various kinds of pollution within our communities. We had water pollution, destruction of, of, of water sources, destruction of forest. We have um, communities relocated from their ancestral land to areas where um, they, they have never been to. And there are no provisions for either economic or livelihood, um, 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 the, the well being in terms of their livelihood. There, there is no provision when they always um, relocate these communities. So for us, um, we think environmental justice is actually, it's supposed to be a kind of a responsive, a responsible interaction between man and the natural ecosystem. It is supposed to be a system where communities are given the power and the chance, the opportunity to say, to make decisions in the use and management of their land and natural resources. But for us in our communities, we serve, it's a different situation. We are experiencing um, variation of pollution, private individuals, corporations are polluting environment with impunity. We have rules, but the rules are enforced selectively. As a result, we always experience an increase in the level of poverty. We experience an increase in the vulnerability of communities. So this is the kind of a picture of um, the environmental issues we are facing. There are laws, but the laws are enforced selectively. And communities who bear the greatest bronze, they continue to face poverty and continue to experience and vulnerability on a, on a daily basis. I want to show um, three videos very quick. The one will be on, um, let me just show you quickly, please. I'm struggling a bit to share the video, please. Uh, well, it's not a video per se, it's a photo. Oh, I have them, Sasan, I can do that. Okay, if you have them, just display them. The first one, um, I'm waiting. Great. These are the problems I'm talking about. This first photo you are seeing, these are a group of artisanal miners. We have a plethora of these spread across the country. They are given license by um, regulatory bodies. These people are given license, but they're not controlled. They leave them just to dig around and um, block waterways, cause deforestation. And by the end of the day, they leave areas like this, pits like this, open and go to nearby areas again to continue their mining. The second video you are seeing here is a machine that is meant to dig or, or mine gold in a river planted right in the middle of the river without any recourse to the repercussions on the environment. And this river flows across so many communities, so many chiefdoms. And it is not only disturbing the livelihood of the people, those who are, wh whose lives are dependent on those on that river, they are also destroying the aquatic life in that river. You see, this is a machine. This machine, it goes around on a daily basis within this river just to mine um, gold. And it is also used to wash the same gold. So the same mas machine doing the digging and doing the washing. So just think of the level of pollution that is, that is um, emitted in that river as a result of this machine. And this is planted here by Chinese nationals. I have the last video. Fine. 
this is where that machine works. And just think of the level of pollution. You see the muddy water. You see the, the, the nature of the water that is that the water that has been transformed as a result of the, 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 the mining, where that machine is planted. These are the kinds of issues, the environmental issues, just an example of them that we have. This is a picture of the environmental problems we have in our country. These are all of these photos you are seeing, they are basically small scale miners artisanal miners. We have those that are caused by large scale miners who are multinational corporations. And those are those ones are causing the greater problems within our communities than this. So for short, this is just a brief picture of what the environmental justice looks like within our, our communities. Yvette, thank you, Hassan, you. thank you. Uh, Hassan, that was Hassan, for, and welcome to folks who are just joining. That was Hassan Sisse from Sierra Leone, a legal empowerment advocate, environmental justice organizer. Let me come to Felipe Zuniga from, from FEMA, uh, an organization, an, an environmental justice organization in Chile, and ask you the same question, if you could paint a picture a bit um, of what the struggle for environmental justice looks like in your context. And I can show pictures as well uh, from the slides when, when, you, when you cue me. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it's it's a sad question because when you ask me for to talk about uh, environmental justice, I just can't think of environmental injustice and how uh, we are responding to that. So effectively, um, the environmental situation in, in Chile is uh, really forged um, in the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. Um, the uh, a neoliberal model of an, an, an extractive model um, lead to the commodification of almost uh, all of our common natural uh, wealth. So I would say that the, the, the main environmental conflict today in Chile is the mega mining. Uh, Chile is a, it's a mining country. Uh, it takes a lot of, of copper and, and silver and gold. Um, and that's a conflict that um, urges all over the country. Uh, in, in the north and in the south, in the Patagonia, we have mining uh, stressing the, the hydric resources, uh, stressing, all, of course, the communities that live there. Um, we have also major uh, problems with the thermoelectrical coal-based plants. Uh, we have the so-called uh, slaughter zones, sacrifice zones, uh, with people that have had um, in massive intoxications uh, for the polluted air. So, and it's like there is a dissemination of responsibility because there is so much industries in so so concentrated in some territories that we are not able to, to look for responsibilities specifically. And that is a major problem that um, until today, it, the, the people uh, have more awareness about it, but we are still struggling. We have decarbonization plans, but um, we have not the certainty and it, it, it is not the, the, the right uh, timing. I think we should be addressing this years, years uh, ago. Um, Another, so uh, it, I, I think that I have some pictures of the thermoelectrical plants in, in Chile, if you can. I, I have just three pictures. <laughs> so, um, that's um, what the picture I'm going to show you. Yeah, that's uh, a locality called Quintero Puchuncavi. Um, it has massive intox intoxication cases more like more than 1000 of persons were intoxicated in just one day um, as you can see um, the, the thermoelectricals are concentrated in the in the coast so there is a major problem uh, for the uh, fisherman that that, that leaps of, of that um, and as you can see it it works 24 7 and 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 also have polluted uh, the waters and the airs. So 
there is a major problem in and and it it explains also by uh, as as Hassan was saying uh, very very low regulation very very uh, a low standard of what we understand of pollution. Uh, the next slide, the next picture is uh, what I was saying about uh, the mega mining. Um, that's in Isla Riesco, uh, 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 a Patagonian Iceland that has the major uh, resources. And it, it relates actually with the thermoelectrical plants. Uh, here is the coal that we are not only using, but also exporting to another countries. So, as you can see, it is a major uh, environmental problem uh, in the land use and uh, in the biodiversity of, of that area. And in the other picture, you can see another of the major problems in our country, that is um, the salmon industry contamination. Um, Chile is a major uh, exporter of, of, of salmon. Um, that salmons are grew in rivers and into the sea, uh, feed it with a lot of antibiotics. And uh, there is massive uh, biological pollution uh, in the waters. If you can go to the next slide. What you can see is red waters uh, only for decomposed and um, sea plant bloom of the biological pollution. Um, maybe one of the, of, of the more interesting and, and more sad parts is that a lot of the salmon that grows in Chile, it, it is fed and, and establish it in uh, some sacred areas from our indigenous people. Uh, and that's not only an environmental impact, but also a very, very strong cultural impact for indigenous people that have uh, ancestral ways to relate with uh, the sea and, 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 and with the nature. And um, it is really the anthropic uh, and, and, and modern way of explode our resources that is polluting in that way that beautiful that beautiful landscape so to talk about actually environmental justice i think that this the the, the demands of the people who are uh, suffering these impacts it's really to to have a voice in it to 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 take real participation in the process um, the mechanisms that uh, our legal institutions uh, provide for participation today are not being effective, um, are not giving power to the people to decide which activities they want to do in their territory and how they want it to do it, or what, at least what are the, the minimum limits of some activities. Uh, we are not talking about the people taking all the decisions, but yes, to have to put some conditions minimum to, to respect this ways of life. and. Um, it, it has uh, like a very interesting um, issue that is happening now, and it's really beautiful, I think, because we are the the, the long term demand for participation. It has already landed in our uh, constitutional process. We are in the process of, to create a new constitution, and all the environmental demands are being a real protagonist of that process. And I think it's because this these people have been demanding for years and organizing for years to demand this and in what i think is the most democratic uh, process of all the history of our country um the environmental demands are really a protagonist we have a lot of uh environmental defenders as constituents as uh, future uh redactors of these constitutions so i think that it's really an expression of how these years of a struggle are when you when you give uh, a space to participate and to really get some incidents, the people would go there and, and and really would put all their work and all their knowledge in there. And I think that it is a really really good opportunity to finally have some decent um, environmental standards, just to have some dignity for the for that person. So that's like um, 
uh, a first approach to the environmental justice here in Chile. Awesome, thank you, Felipe Zuniga, who's an advocate and organizer with FEMA in Chile. And welcome to folks who are just joining. I'm gonna to turn to Vidya Viswanathan, who, is, who works with Center for Policy Research in India, which is the uh, group that Namati partners with in, in India, and ask you the same question, Vidya, which is, what, could you paint a picture of what environmental injustice and the pursuit of environmental justice looks like in your context? Yeah, um, actually, to begin with, uh, it's important to understand that India is at a very interesting crossroads of becoming a giant economy, right? For the last few years, it has been the poster child for the emerging markets, uh, holding promising economic growth, uh, during foreign investments. But unfortunately, these public policies, which are steered to accelerate the economic growth, has also put the country's ecosystem under immense pressure. And just to put things in perspective, India was recently ranked 168th out of 180 countries in the Yale Columbia Environmental Performance Index. As per studies, seven out of 10 cities with the worst air pollution on earth are situated in India while uh, 275 out of 445 rivers, almost close to 50% in India have been officially declared polluted. And these figures are just the tip of the problem. The mega push towards massive land transformation to support rapid urbanization or industrialization is leading to loss of common resources, sensitive ecological habitats, leading to extreme weather conditions with frequent storms, floods, droughts. But what is interesting is that, unfortunately, you know, mostly the poor and the marginalized communities are the ones who are made to bear a disproportionate burden of this environmental cost of development. You'll often see that harmful projects uh, such as uh, polluting industrial units, uh, municipal disposal sites or mining projects are often situated uh, right next to poor neighborhoods. These communities actually grapple on a daily basis with the environmental impacts, which leads to livelihood loss, which constantly exposes them to toxic contamination, which uh, impairs their you know, access to common resources or mobility. These environmental impacts not only degrade their immediate environment, but also significantly curtail their ability to live a life of dignity and safety. Uh, what is really interesting about this is that we do have laws that regulate these activities, that, that, are, that, that mandates certain environmental safeguards to be built in to mitigate the impacts from these activities. But of course, more than often not, these uh, regulations are really good on papers. And when it comes to the ground level, there is no implementation at all. In the last one decade, there have been multiple studies uh, undertaken by civil society groups and government agencies as well, which have suggested that you know, upwards of 90% of the industrial or development projects that operate are operating in gross violation or non-compliance of the regulations, leading to irreversible environmental degradation. And our team works in closing that enforcement gap. Uh, if I were to help you visualize, uh, you know, what injustice looks like in the areas where we work and uh, what is the idea of justice that we strive for, we work towards, I will use these two images. Uh, Vivek, if you could, just use the images. I'm on it, just one second. Yeah. Yes. Injustice in the areas where we work is when communities are made to breathe this air, 
residing next to a company which is spewing toxic air day in, day out. And by communities, I mean women, children, elderly, and most of these communities are from the marginalized sectors, right? They are indigenous communities, poor communities, minority communities, communities like that. Injustice is when a farmer uh, towards your right hand side on the top, you can see the transportation of mineral happening, the unsecured, insecure, uh, uh, you know, transportation of mineral happening, causing this haze of iron ore dust. Injustice is when the farmer whose farmland is unfortunately located right next to this road loses 50% of his annual yield because this dust settles on the farmland and spoils the entire crop. In, towards the bottom of your right hand, injustice is when the tribal hamlet is forced to use this water body, uh, this water body, which is completely contaminated by the toxic discharge from the company. They're, they're forced to use this water for all the domestic purpose. Injustice is this. I mean, if you were to visualize what injustice looks like, this is what injustice looks like in the areas where we work. And what is the idea of justice? How does justice look? Uh, can we go to the next slide? Yes. So the, these are some before and after pictures you usually see in uh, you know, these ads of health transformations and body transformations. Actually, this is like the justice transformation for us. Uh, most of these pictures, I'm so sorry for those numbers being there. Uh, uh, sorry for that, but uh, I hope you, get, you guys get the drift. Justice is when, the, when a company which has been for years operating in gross violation of regulations is made to uh, comply to the rules and safely and securely transport minerals. You know, providing relief to many communities which have been breathing in that haze of iron ore dust. Justice is when a thermal power plant, which has been uh, towards your right hand side, when a thermal power plant uh, had been indiscriminately dumping fly ash into the only water body accessible to a tribal hamlet is directed by the administrative body to not only stop the indiscriminate dumping, but also to clean and restore the water body to its original state. Justice is when a company which has been operating without any uh, mandated physical infrastructure to mitigate the impacts coming from the co company is directed to build those infrastructures and cough up significant amount of money to build these infrastructures and ensure that the impacts from these operations are mitigated in the most effective manner. This is what we strive for. We basically strive for implementing the rule of law and also bettering that, that version of law as we move along. And I'll just stop there. Thank you so much, V. So powerful to see those images, including the, 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 the the changes between before and after. And so very much building on that, I wanted to ask each of you about how, given the grave injustices that you have described, how do you and the communities you work with go about building power in the face of these injustices? And, and I'll, I'll start with uh, Hassan again. Yeah, thank you very much again. and. I'll uh, use maybe two words to describe a whole sense of our environmental injustices. For us, it's like a death trap where the future is bleak. People don't know where to go next, but the laws are there and they are not fully implemented. So that is the irony. Although some of the laws are faulty, but we are in the process of making those laws better. But for, in the meantime, what we have is another problem that contributes to the violations and the, 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 the harms that communities are facing. Now, let me give you, um, a, maybe I'll put, this, put it as a case study for a company that is operating in one of our communities. It's a very big company. It's a multinational company that um, came in, acquired land through the government. 
instead of meeting the communities, negotiate with them, talk with them, they just talk with the government and the government grants them access to the land. So they went into the land. Before you know it, the bulldozers, machines are all over, bringing down trees, and then um, they start their, start their operations. But the biggest problem, this area is a hilly area. The mining is done right up the hills, while the communities are at the base of the hills. That is the biggest, biggest problem with this mining investment. So the operation of this company led to the spillage of oil and tailings of iron ore down to the streams, down to the, the swamps, and the swamps are contaminated, the streams are contaminated with um, so many chemicals. There is oil spillage, and you can see the particles of the, the iron ore and even the oil that um, spill from the tailings dam to the rivers, I mean, to the streams and the nearby swamps. And these swamps, yes, that is it. These are the only sources of livelihood for the communities, these swamps. They do their farming in these swamps. The streams is their only source of drinking safe water. The streams are polluted and alternative sources of drinking water are not provided. So the communities are left with no options, no alternative source of livelihood. They continue to pollute the land. And you see where this person is standing. That is the nature of the land that they have transformed into as a result of the continuous pollution. This where you are seeing some level of grass just tells you the, 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 the amount of erosion that has taken place to an extent that the, the surface is no more, um, is, is no more um, good for agricultural purposes. They cannot plant there. They cannot do anything there. In fact, if you stand on this soil, the whole soil will kind of be, um, 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 it's, it's a shaky, substance it's not strong anymore the the soil cannot grab a hole itself together anymore so it's telling us the level of damage that has occurred in this land but the authorities at the same time are not doing anything to salvage the situation so what the communities did first is to report the whole thing to at least make their concerns known to the company through their liaison officers, make their concerns uh, made known to, to, to the, the traditional authorities and even the regulatory bodies, but nobody listens to them. So they eventually have to call on Namati to see how best we can all team up to find a solution out of this one. And I must say, this is one of the complex issues we've handled where you see um, you see, I'll put it directly as a level of wickedness on the part of regulatory bodies and the government as well. This is the only livelihood, source of livelihood for the communities. Of all the reports made by the communities, nobody listens to them. Nobody talks to them. So what we did as a way of building the power of the people, we took them through a process of finding facts how um, to prove to them that indeed they are living with this problem. And by, um, as by research, research proved that these substances um, that you are seeing, these um, bluish or reddish substances have contain some arsenic poison. And this poison continue to seep through the groundwater. Even in future, after 100 or more years, this poison will continue to live within those communities. So even generations yet unborn will continue to suffer from this harm this company has done to them. So with this, we, we conducted a fact-finding exercise together with the people. 
went around with them to see where the problems are. And at the end of the day, we sat together with the people to design goals and strategies, how we should move on from that point to seeking remedy. So we empowered them to be able to speak for themselves. We empower them to be able to identify themselves as um, people that are suffering from the same problem and should be able to speak in one voice. We empower them to be able to navigate through authorities because we are building um, them to be change agents and not to rely on us continuously to be able to seek remedies. So as a result, we, we empower them to write letters to the company as well as the regulatory bodies those who have not listened to them, those who they have sent letters before, they have not listened to them, they have not visited them. Our intervention with the communities, with the power they have now, they were able, together with, 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 with us, we were able to get the attention of the, the Environmental Protection Agency to visit the area, because that is the one thing they have never done with all of all the cries communities have made, they have never visited those areas. So they were able to draw the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency officials, to visit the site, at least to see um, the, the, the level of their suffering that has been meted as a result of the, the operations of the company. But again, they came around, took photos, um, and then made fabulous promises of taking um, um, the stringent measures to curb the situation. Nothing is done. Again, they were also able to push the company, the communities, to a meeting. So they finally had a meeting with the management of the company, where, interestingly, the company, um, um, the, 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 like, kind of confirmed it to the communities, like the, the claim liability of the problems, that this pollution is caused as a result, as a result of our, our activities. So what else? The communities place their demands that one, they need to rehabilitate the, the swamp. They need to provide alternative sources of drinking water. They need to compensate them for the swamp. And they need to seize with immediate effect the operations of the company and they seize the, the pollution with immediate effect. All what was said, the only thing the company that was able to do is to compensate the communities for what they have, the pollution they have caused. With all the, the efforts, working through the central government authorities, working through the regulatory bodies, working through the, the, the traditional authorities, the communities are still in this state. And um, unfortunately, the mining company that has Cause this problem has folded operations in that area. But a new company, the Chinese company, again has taken operations um, from within these areas to continue with their mining operation. So, this is the nature of the problems we are, uh, we are facing, the communities are facing. And this is how far we have gone to let the people know in the first place what the laws are. Because the people are, they are aware that there are laws that's, that, that's supposed to protect them from this harm, but they don't know the laws. So we took them through all of those processes to understand that this is um, against this law. Because um, after the fact finding, we read through the processes of the report. They realized that indeed what the law says and what is actually happening in their communities as a whole different ball game. And at the same time, the authorities who are supposed to defend them, to protect them, to, to, to cater for their well-being, they just leave them at the mercy of the company. And to this date, we are still fighting with those authorities to ensure the right thing is done with those communities. And I bring up this case because it is one of the the complex issues that we are still handling from, I would say three or four years back, we are still dealing with this complex issue. We are, with all the level of empowerment people have gotten, 
with all the, the laws they have known, how to, how to use this law, they are still um, kept in the position they have been put by these companies. And we are still grappling with strategies as to how to bring authorities and these corporations to see that the right thing is, happen, um, is done for these communities. Thank you, Hassan. So far, this is Thank how you. we have gone far with these communities. Thank you. Thank you. Let me turn to Felipe and Vidya, and then I want to open up um, and have a conversation with the audience. But yeah, Felipe, how have you guys um, gone about building community power in the face of the grave environmental justice you, you were describing and perhaps a lesson or two that you have learned along the way? Yes. Um, well, the, to, to understand, to the people, to the audience to understand, the, the ultimate goal of FEMA is um, the protection of the right to live in a healthy environment. Um, we are mostly lawyers, so we focus it a lot on the legal defense of that right. But of course, uh, in these 20 years of work, we have uh, development the certainty that the litigation is not enough. Uh, and as the courts and the judges um, are every year getting um, more pro-environment, I would say, um, most of the most transformative uh, rulings, are, they are not able to implement it. They're not able to, to, to fulfill it. Um, actually, the, this main issue in Quintero Pochuncavi about the intoxication of the people because of the uh, thermoelectrics and the complex of industry in that, um, you have a transformative and a very significant ruling that this is the second year that it's, it's not yet complained. Um, and we are, of course, using all the tools that we have in hand to, to make it right, but there is uh, actually still um, uh, uh, an institutional incapacity to really address these topics. Um, so in that context, in a concept with the litigation is not enough. Uh, of course, we have focused a lot on the legal empowerment. Uh, that's, all, that's always the, the first step. Um, we, we, are, we are doing legal empowerment, we are doing investigation, we are doing political advocacy to change the laws, and also um, litigation, of course. But I think that the, the, the first step of this legal empowerment is not just uh, explain to the people um, what are their rights uh, in the actual regulation, but also to, for us to understand what are the rights that have been invisible side. So um, I, I can only ask for, uh, uh, an indigenous people, what it means to them, commun to their community, uh, what is a polluted lake? Uh, I, I, can, I, can, I can really not understand it, and we are always trying to get these voices to the courts, but there is still an institutional incapacity uh, to address these topics. So what we are mainly focusing uh, is explain and, and really clarify, clarify to these communities, what are the key uh, obstacles to the legal empowerment, to, the, to environmental democracy, and really address that topics in a, in a dual, in, in a double way. Uh, we are in the court litigating, and we are also, they are also in the streets, uh, mostly demanding dignity, you know, but it is, it's, it is very crucial for in the moment of uh, the litigation to have political and civic pressure. Uh, and that's the only way that we have seen that the, the line is getting uh, to the side, you know? So that's, that's one thing. We are mainly focusing on uh, giving the people the right tools to participate in the most uh, significant way um, to really uh, rethink the argumentative issues to the judge and we have uh, really strong results of that and also uh, another learning that I, I, I would share is that 
it is really important to articulate different struggles, different fights, and to understand that one local impact uh, of, a, of a territory, uh, it would probably take an impact in a national level and a, a global level too. So it has been very important to link the impacts of the thermoelectrical plants in the, some localities in Chile with global change, uh, climate change. So um, it, 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 it has also been important to link um, some mega mining projects in, uh, in the mountains, in the Cordillera de los Andes, uh, with the um, with the hydric security of the Santiago of, of the capital and of uh, of another another regions. So there is also like this double level of a local impact and the relationship with a national and a global impact, and that is really important one to articulate with other organizations as we are doing here, uh, and to link also nationally with uh, what is a really uh, national public policy problem. Why are we letting, uh, why it is allowed to have this kind of projects? It's because our regulation allows that. And that is the reason there is not just one, uh, it is 20, 100. And, and it's also, and, and I think the last question to, to, to give the, the floor to Vidya is that for us, it has been really important to, uh, to make visible who are the uh, companies that are behind this because it's really um, three or four names always you know in every conflict there is no more of five principal transnationals that is behind that and the people is really clicking on that uh, who are the persons what are their names who are their nationalities like it is really important for us for example um to link that the mega mining in chile uh is almost british and canada like there are the, the the countries that are doing that here um um uh, norwegian is almost a, a lot of influence in the salmon industry in the in the south of chile so that visibility is is facing a post-colonialism uh, approach that i think that is really clicking in, in in people and i think that it's really also uh, bringing fights together, the feminist fight and the indigenous fight and the environmental fight principally. So that's like uh, 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 some you. of the approaches that we are uh, trying to implement. And there, I think that it, it had been some incipient success. We are now trying to get these uh, things real. So thank you, Felipe. Thank you. Vidya, let me turn to you if you could briefly, I mean, you showed us those very powerful before and after photos, you could briefly say a bit more about how the team in India has managed to build power among communities and advance environmental justice. And then I would like to open up to the audience before we run out of time. Yeah. So basically, so far, we have worked on over 250 cases of non-compliances recorded by our team. Uh, using our approach, we have been able to achieve compliance in almost 64% of cases. It's still a small drop in the ocean, but still a great achievement from where we had started. We had, uh, through these cases, we have almost benefited directly some 200,000 community members and indirect beneficiaries will definitely be many fold. What I would like to uh, highlight is the way our team works. Like, our team members don't both the hats of a researcher and a community organizer. They carefully document all the information related to these instances of non-compliances and an analyze them. Because the idea is not to just, you know, go into a community, work on the case and achieve a remedy and move on. The idea is to carefully collect all these uh, information, all these experiences generated through the casework, and then try and see and understand the larger systemic breakdown in the regulatory framework, which these you know, instances of non-compliances are merely symptoms of. And uh, during such reflections, we realized that most of the cases where we worked, the issues had been prevalent for more than a decade. Like almost 80% of the cases where we received remedy, the people had been living with those impacts for 10, 15, 20 years. 
and uh, uh, I mean, luckily, or uh, what do you say? I mean, definitely, <laughs> you know, after our intervention, we were able to achieve remedy within two years. This is not to say, this is not to basically uh, say that the process is very easy and we just go in there and we get remedy. No, not at all. The process is very intensive. Why I use these figures, why I uh, called out these figures is to give you guys an understanding that where these communities come from. Most of these communities having lived with the impacts for 10, 15, 20 years end up getting normalized to these impacts, right? In maximum of our cases, when whenever the field teams go up to communities who are reeling under these impacts, the first response is, you know, it's all right. Toxicity is an inevitable cost of development. If we want development in our region, we would have to breathe this toxic air. And that is the narrative that has been kind of, you know, fed into them by the power bearers of the society, by the people who have vested interest that, you know, if you want to have development, this is like a, this is like a small cause that one has to bear. So for us, you know, the idea, the, the, the intervention is not to just go to the community and tell them what is there in the law and, you know, which institution to go into. No, our conversation actually focuses on developing that agency in these people. And that's where the role of legal empowerment comes in, right? The word empowerment, you cannot really define, say, empowerment without building agencies in, people, in the people. And that's, that's where, you know, the process is so intensive. Most of our conversations, you know, not only focuses on the legal information, but also helps people develop that agency, develop that perspective that, you know, uh, take up that lens to understand that what is right, what is wrong, what are, what are these illegalities and why they have been given an unfair treatment or uh, how they have been given an unfair treatment. And this change is so intrinsic. It's such a sustainable and internal change that happens during these uh, conversations with the community members, which is a very sustainable change which you know stays up and this is where the power gets built up because if I uh, were to speak about the community members that we have worked with most of our community members have turned into environmental stewards who have now started taking up you know similar cases in their vicinity using the same approach without the help of paralegals or field researchers and they have become their own paralegals in their own community and uh, uh, in initial days I remember our field teams used to go out on the field and try and find out issues to work on. And now we get calls from communities where they don't even work. And, you know, and this is from the word of mouth because this approach has had uh, uh, such an impact on people. And when we talk about, you know, building that agency in communities, it's also a very, uh, very carefully thought out, slow, uh, intensive process because communities not only train themselves to kind of, you know, to be able to understand these technical legal documents, which could even put a lawyer to sleep, because these documents are so uh, technically written, they're so, uh, uh, they're written in such a manner that can put anybody to sleep. So, you know, training them to read through these technical documents, training them to kind of, you know, be able to hold up a conversation with an administrative official. That is also a huge change, huge shift, which happens. And uh, the fact that these communities are, you know, being invested, they're investing their time and resources to getting trained, to holding up these conversations with the administrative officials. And mind you, like, you know, we work in areas where there have been so many, such a strong power dynamics between community members and local officials. There is almost like a hierarchical relationship. And, you know, barring those relationships, people are able to, you know, kind of, you know, build that agency to kind of, you know, train themselves uh, uh, with the legal knowledge to hold that conversation with administrative bodies, collaborate with them to work on these issues and then demand rightfully their place in the environmental decision making process and that is where i feel that at every stage this process is designed in such a beautiful manner that at every stage we are building power in the communities and i feel you know after this process we have inevitably built a, a you know an organic constituency of legally empowered individuals who are you know using this you have taken up this approach and are, are running with it i'll just uh, yeah yeah uh, if we are running short of time, I'll not talk about the case example, but yeah, oh, I yes. feel that, uh, yeah, I feel the process itself of legal empowerment, uh, which has been designed and which has been carefully thought out, uh, you know, cultivates that power 
you know, you. cultivate that power at every stage. Indeed. Well, I, I just want to, because we are running short on time, I want to make sure that we bring some other voices in from the, from the crew that has joined us. I just say that, you know, we see deep commonalities between these struggles and you can hear them coming through from these three perspectives. Namathi co-convenes the Legal Empowerment Network, and maybe one of my colleagues would just drop the link in the chat. I, I would invite everyone here to, to, to join if, 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 if you wish. Um, it, the network is made up of grassroots justice groups from all over the world, and we are in the process of deepening the ways in which we can learn from one another on these, on these very common struggles. And our hope is to build together towards better norms and systems uh, related to the, the, these urgent challenges of environmental and economic governance. Um, so we'd love to do that with you all and, and please do join us. And now I'm just gonna open it up for some questions or reflections. Um, and feel free to turn on your camera. I think we don't have such a big group that um, we can't just allow people to, to speak up directly. Um, I see one from um, Anushi. Um, Oh that, oh, that one might be just to me. Um, Those are questions from the chat that I'm oh, just okay. sending them to you. Got it, got it, got it, got it. So someone was asking about a program in Texas, and I, I, I apologize um, if there's someone here who I need to kind of circle back to. We, we have been um, working directly on the ground in, in the U.S. over the last few years, and we, we, we did have really um, promising conversations with colleagues in in on the Gulf Coast as well as in the Great Lakes, but we ended up choosing a focus close to where we are. I'm speaking from Washington, DC. So our work has been centered in this kind of Chesapeake region of DC, Delaware, Virginia, Maryland. Um, but we would love to reconnect and share what we've learned so far and, and, and um, see if there are opportunities to, to learn from each other. And certainly um, people from Texas, I, I would invite you guys to be a part of this kind of global environmental justice core that we're in the process of building. Um, and I'll drop in the chat the, the link where you can where you can um, become a part of that. And then another question came in: um, What kind of support would be most effective for advocates here in the U.S.? Um, who who was that? Do you do you want to elaborate a little bit? Feel free to turn on your camera and unmute, unmute yourself. And, and if, if not now, then do jump in as, as we proceed. Someone had a question for Hassan in particular. Did the company not provide Queen supply of water? Do you wanna, do you wanna um, speak to that, Hassan? Yeah, well, they, they made attempts, but that is not sufficient at all. They created water wells in um, two of the communities. But the, the, considering the population in the community, there is so much pressure in the use of that water. And by the time they get to the dry season, the wells are all dry. So they are still in the same problem. Anybody else want to jump in with a question or an observation or a reflection? Feel free to unmute yourself and turn your video on. Introduce yourself. I mean, a question that I would ask the group is, how do these experiences resonate with what you um, are experiencing in your own neighborhood, in your own life? How do you compare um, the circumstances that these folks are describing with the circumstances that you're familiar with? I see Maria trying to speak, but I can hear it. Maria. Yeah, Maria, we can't hear you, unfortunately. Is, if you could, I hope we haven't muted her. No, she's not muted from our end. Okay. Maria, since we can't hear you, um, please feel free to write in on the chat. So the question about water was to Maria as well. Um, okay. So maybe, maybe she was trying to follow up with that. And okay. Feel free to write in the chat since we can't hear you, Maria. Yeah. Anybody else? We've got seven minutes left.
It's a lot to take in. Well, the floor is open. I mean, I would just reflect some of the common things that I saw coming out of these presentations. One is the gap in enforcement. I think that came through all three, that we've got laws on the books, we've got progressive judgments, as you mentioned, Felipe, from the courts, and yet getting those laws and those judgments implemented is one of the big challenges. And I, I think that resonates with the American experience as well. Um, another common theme that stands out is just a huge imbalance of power between communities on the one hand and companies and governments on the other hand. And a third one is the lack of voice of the people who are most affected in making decisions about what happens to the land and the environment. Um, and it's exciting to hear Felipe, you know, the, the talks about the Chilean constitution and how we might create some of that space for the first time. There's some legislation that communities are organizing for across Sierra Leone that would create that space for communities to have a greater say in what happens to their places. Um, and I know that that's been a core demand for the folks in India as well. So I do feel like that idea of, you know, free prior informed consent of a voice in decision making, uh, a role in enforcement of laws for the people who are most affected by environmental harms, that, that does feel like a very kind of common demand that emerges across many, many different contexts. Um, anybody else with a, with a question for one of our amazing panelists or an observation or a or a comparison to your own experience. Our precious time is, is limited. So I do see Maria's question got into the chat. Um, okay. Let me see if I can pull it up. She said, um, I'm lightened to see how similar the struggles are. So why did barefoot lawyering work with India? What is different? And that's um, Maria from, oh, is that Maria Payan, my friend? Maria um, Payan, is that Maria Payan? Is that who it was? Yes, that's her. Okay, who's, who's, um, who we're excited to be partnering with on this regional coalition we're building. Maria does amazing work related to industrial agriculture in Maryland, Delaware, um, and, uh, and is a powerful barefoot lawyer herself in, in, in a way. I mean, I, 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 we have seen versions of legal empowerment. She, she was saying barefoot law and basically trying to demystify the law, combine the power of law with the power of organizing to get results in many places, including I visited Maria in Delaware and seen amazing successes that she has had by doing that, by, by combining the power of law with the power of organizing. But Vidya, do you wanna, do you wanna speak to her question? It's true that India is in a very difficult circumstance, um, the, the political economy, the imbalances of power are, are extreme. How, do you wanna say a bit more of how you have actually managed to get results despite those adverse circumstances? Yeah, actually, uh, yes. You know, uh, there are a, a combination of challenges which gets thrown at us and every case that we work on has a, a, a different set of risks, has a peculiar situation that we end up facing. What has helped us uh, so far is to consider administrative bodies a natural ally. So I just want to give you a bit of a background. Like in India, most of the environmental action groups, you know, uh, previous to when we started working, most of the environmental action groups had been either focusing on litigation or protests or, you know, going, uh, going through these, uh, 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 you know, large scale protests and uh, taking an adversarial stand. Most of the environmental action work was seen as an adversarial uh, uh, initiative or intervention by the by the civil society groups. What we tried to do was to create a middle path, which was basically we were actually bringing in the community organizing element from the from one spectrum and uh, getting the legal information and the legal understanding from another spectrum and create a very uh, novel approach, which was very non adversarial to begin with. And that essentially, you know, helped us get a lot of uh, first aid, you know, help us uh, circumvent that initial resistance by the officials. Because, you know, our stand from the very beginning was not to shut down this company. You know, this, you know, usually environmentalists are seen as uh, the uh, non, uh, you know, the, the people against development and people who don't want, who don't believe in certain developmental paradigm, which is like the mainstream. 
our idea was to kind of you know steer away from all those narratives and ensure that you know our stand was non adversarial from the very beginning and our stand was most you know almost kind of mirrored what the re regulatory bodies are supposed to do we were basically pushing for the rule of law to get implemented we were basically wanting to collaborate with the administrative bodies we were basically wanting to kind of you know help the regulatory bodies improve the enforcement on the ground we did face a lot of resistance but in a lot many places we also faced that you know administrative officials were not able to enforce the these laws due to genuine resource crunch and they were delighted at the fact that you know there were community members who were basically coming to their office and sitting with them helping them understand being their eyes and ears on the ground giving them evidence to kind of take action so that kind of strategy really helped us to begin with and that really led and that really also kind of helped us stay away from the uh, from the other varieties of distractions being you know being an anti national being uh, being anti development of the country and things like that our narrative had been very very simple and straightforward that we want the companies to of course we want the companies to operate they have come here they are leading to uh, economic development and generation of revenue but we want we just simply want them to abide to the rules they were basically uh, given consent or clearances uh, uh, against so that has been a very carefully crafted and we ensure that you know as a as an approach we don't get into litigation at all as a group we are trying to activate that administrative channel which is mm -hmm. least which is least uh, you know uh, used or applied to or which is least mm. resorted to so we created we activated the most uh, the least resorted channel with a very non adversarial stance so that has been the strategy which has helped thank you vidya i realize rachel we're at time is it okay for those who can we stay on for 5 minutes yeah okay. absolutely okay well and if anyone does have to run thank you so much for being here um uh we, felipe was just going to speak to this question that came in on corruption <clears throat> yes um the the question was uh that Sorry, sorry, sorry. Ah, if the lack of enforcement is due to corruption of a lack of resources combination, etc. Um, I think there there is always uh, a level of corruption in the status quo, you know. But um, in this case, at, at least in Chilean case, I think that it's really, and I, I think that it's related to the other cases that we listened to today. Um, is uh, power distribution very very low distribution of power so in chile is really uh, it is almost impressively transparent how the companies have so much power um the decisions that in the environmental decisions that affect nature and communities are always in the under the, this discourse of uh development you know uh this is the way to develop and and if you want don't want to develop we the companies are going to go away and that is going to be uh less development for this country so it is really um a lack of distribution of power uh and and, and what i was saying before and institutional incapacity to redistribute that power uh that is one of the reasons because we are so we have so much hope in this constitution because it is really a main obstacle to the uh, distribution of the power we think that the results of this process we will see it um 10 years from now uh, the, the the real the most deep uh, impacts so i think that is uh, uh, in in a way uh, corruption uh, of course uh, limited uh, resources to achieve this, but it is the, the lack of tools for the states to regulate uh, industries that have been extracting resources since 100 years, maybe. So um, it, it needs to, to, to move that line, it needs really, really a lot of uh, empowerment from the people, a lot of organization. and. We are seeing uh, a, a, a tangible result, uh, result of that today, but it is a long way to go if we really want to protect uh, what is needed for us 
to 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 really develop and to have digni dignity. Philippe, I think that's a that's a good note to end on that call to building the power we need to transform the systems of governance that we have to turn around the dynamics, the perilous dynamics that we are in right now. So I just want to give a huge thanks to the three of you, Hassan Sisei, Felipe, um, <clears throat> and Vidya, and thanks to everybody who was able to join and continue to build with us. I, I dropped the link in the chat, how you can be part of the Legal Empowerment Network, and we hope to build with all of you a stronger global environmental justice movement in the months and, and years to come. Peace, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Take Thank care. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you.